Um, I'd just like to pick up on a point that the panel were making about information sharing, and I thought it was a very interesting interpretation that you made, Sean, on the word systematic. Um, you interpreted systematic as being information being shared through regulation or because you have to share information. And I think the key thing we see is that there is a real difference between information that is being shared because you have to and information that is being shared in a way that others can actually defend themselves. So that information being um, threat intelligence, which is actually actionable and you can actually use. Because otherwise, what you get, if you, get, if you go down the regulation route um, and threat intelligence being shared because you have to, it's a bit like a fire hose being turned on. There's just so much data that just gets poured at organizations. They can't actually make any sense of it and can't turn it into um, intelligence they can use to defend themselves. So I think that systematic word is key. It's what you share and how you share it is absolutely, absolutely essential to defend it, helping people to and should, help you should to you operate think From your experience and BAE's experience worldwide, does that need to be mandated or can you leave it up to individual companies to select or does what they need to or desire to share? I think it's, I think it's interesting. Um, I've, as I say, I've seen, two, I've seen it go down both routes, both in the US and the UK and, and in other places. When it's been regulated, and it, it does tend to be that kind of fire hose effect, when people are sharing in information because they understand that if they share information, they get something back as long as it's a certain type of, of, of intelligence, then um, people just do it because it's the right, because it's a good thing for them to do. You get a reciprocal benefit, and that goes for government, and it also goes for industry. Okay. Uh, if, I, if I just want... I think this is a very key point. Um, for instance, coming back to the incidents uh, of Raskas, I guess at that time, I would not have been very interested in the details of the incident itself, but more in what people now call IOC, indication of compromise. These are the elements that, had they been able to give me, I would have been able to check in my own company if I, had, if I were seeing that. So, do I see some of my, my machines talking back to that bizarre domain name or do I see that kind of weird traffic? These in, um, indicators of compromise are actionable knowledge, pieces of information I can use to actually better protect myself. And that kind of information is, there are ways, sometimes you don't want to reveal some of these things, but there are, and this is where research kicks in again, there are ways to share step-by-step uh, building trust what, by means what of different crypto techniques. What was Raskas able to share that was that you can share now of lessons learned uh, uh, and was there critical useful areas that you weren't able to share and yeah, still are not? I, I think there were what was probably important immediately was the immediate measure that needed to uh, uh, probably further protect the system. But there were mid-term or longer term that lessons that also were equally important for, uh, for sustainability. Of, uh, now for the immediate, it was the technique used, it was uh, the vulnerability that existed, the, 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 uh, there were certain, uh, I think, um, uh, these were coming from certain region or certain IP addresses and so on and so on, which I think uh, this is very much was managed by, by the team on the ICT. So these uh, were, I think, immediate inf information. I think the, the longer, uh, probably, uh, term or mid-term kind of uh, le hard lesson that we got out of this, because uh, I think I, uh, I was focused on the investigation to extract these learning and, I, 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 I spent a little bit more time trying to understand what happened, how it happened, and how we can uh, really take the necessary measure to protect this from reoccurring. The, the one that I think uh, probably stand out is the complexity of the system we create. And that goes, we do build a lot of complexity that becomes very difficult to manage and understand sometimes. The complexity of your own system. Yes. yes. I.e., it's too complex. Yes, that's the, and then the processes and the structure to, to manage that, and that's added complexity. 
So when then you come to the communication, the segregation of duty, does people know what they are responsible for and so on, then you find out where the gaps that were that created this probably uh, opportunity to be taken advantage of. At least I think that was one element. The other thing that probably stand out for me was uh, recruitment. How do we recruit uh, security specialists? Recruitment? Yeah, how do you recruit uh, data scientists? Or no, no, I'm just saying you need to have a person who has superior knowledge and experience, experience to hire your, and if you don't have that, you should go elsewhere too. You don't do it without having the knowledge. Right. So that you, as another exposure. Do you how is that, if you take a macro view on that across Qatar, how deficient are we from a talent point of view? We can buy the technology off the shelf, we can get QCRI to do some research, but from talent that you need? I, I think it is the scarcity is not just on Qatar, it's worldwide. Uh, security experts are, are really very few. They are, there are a lot of people with education and qualification that they attain, but are they experts in the field? It's really, really a very scarce commodity. In Qatar, they were probably a handful at the time, and I had the opportunity to, to meet with them. I think ICT did build Perhaps some the challenge is growing faster than the the discipline, the educational programs and so on uh, are, are not being able to build fast enough in order to, to uh, take on the challenge. I'd like to just uh, ask Anna to come in on, having recently come into Qatar, come into Qatar Gas, the, the kind of challenges you are facing to upgrade uh, to the standards that you would recognize or that you're uh, being asked to deal with, what are the, uh, the challenges to achieve that? regardless of a law or not a law. All right, so um, let's take it in two perspectives. There is the uh, physical challenge. You're working with some very obsolete systems and systems that have very limited um, software signature where, let's take for example, the usual Windows shrink wrap, a commercial off-the-shelf ver version that you run in your desktop is not the same version that we run in these control systems. So if you try to retrofit security in this environment, you will either run into A, problem number one, is the configuration doesn't exist. Number two, it's configurable, but if you touch it, you shut it down. So these are some of the challenges that we face when we're trying to retrofit a legacy system for security. And you can't really very easily justify an upgrade because it's still fit to run. So it becomes a, bis a, a critical business decision. Where do we find a balance between compliance and security? The answer there is, what is your objective in securing the entire system? Is it to cut off external connections or, or uh, threat actors' physical uh, security? Then we can do that other ways. So there's always alternative compensating controls that you can apply, and short of that, you have to then look at the risk, right? The, 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 does the design of your controls, is that commensurate with the risk of exposure to your control systems? Let's bring up the next survey question, but it commensurate with your risk. How do you know what your risk is, what your target is, if that risk is growing all the time? We 66% increase in last year. The, the, the nature of the cyber disruption is, changing all the time. Right, so that is a fair question, but, but here's the typical risk that you would encounter in an industrial control system environment, which is more of a process operation speak. Uh, most of this control system environment, the biggest risk is loose, loss of control. When we say loss, loss of, of control, control of the right, operations. Of the operations, which means you have significant financial, operational, environmental uh, impact, right, instantaneously. So if you try to quantify that loss, it will then lead you to one and one and only answer. Loss of production equals financial risk. Now the answer of we have other um, factors that impact that risk, such as if you're open to the internet, if you have external mode connections, if you're running without antivirus because it's not compatible with your system, you equally have the risk of being infected. Right, so the only way you can tie that risk 
is to use the same matrix so what what is my risk in terms of quantifying it in uh, safety health environmental and operational what is the degree of, of uh, uh, difficulty in breaching my system which means that if I'm able to just insert a USB therefore I shut down my HMI that does my process control uh, that there's my risk my financial environment right so there, there's always a way that you can connect cybersecurity threats and vulnerabilities to true operational and process reliability risks. okay let's go to uh, the next question if everybody would like to vote services and consultants are the most frequent cause cause of supply chain compromise should Qatari energy companies reduce their outsourcing requirements to third parties and build up their internal capabilities to analyze the data that sit at the core of their operations and thus, thus reduce the potential of cyber threats. So 10 seconds, basically build up national capacity, company capacity, yes versus no, or is outsourcing just more viable access to much greater competence? Ooh, we've got a, a half, half room here today. And what's your own view on that, Mr. Kevin? I, I don't think we should be uh, overreacting, actually. I think uh, you should always look at expertise. Uh, and you would think that there are sufficient uh, contractual and uh, information uh, security to, to, to take care of that. If we start doubting, uh, really, even the vendors, to, I think it's, it's going to go beyond just this. But surely, should we not be looking to build, let's say, the capacity of the likes of QCRI uh, uh, to ensure that they are yeah, offering I, the service? I, I, think, I think, in my view, we should build the capacity. But I think they should be showing their capabilities to other to convince them that they can do as good as a job or even better. But I think if we say, Shut down, go there. I don't think this is a good business model. Okay. Your excellent. I, I answered no. No? Yeah. The reason is I agree also with Mohammed because we need to have a balanced system. We need to build capacity and we need to control the supply chain. You can control the supply chain. Yes, there were, in the past, there were a couple of disruptions that went public domain because the source was the supply chain. However, you know, you have, we, we as a government, the industry, have invented measures to control the risk coming from the supply chain. So there should be a balanced system to maintain both. And I think in the industry and finance, you know, it's very challenging, it's evolving. You will always be dependent on international resources. So you cannot stop it. And okay. you cannot overreact. So I think we should be very pragmatic. Um, so this will not happen. So let's be pragmatic. In the first okay, point. it won't and, happen, but the but, point nonetheless is, again, how do you build up national capacity right. if you constantly outsource? But you were mentioning QCRI, so QCRI is not there to replace in any way services and consultant, right? Among the, you know, if you have that many problems today with respect to cybersecurity in SCADA system, ICS, probably up to here you can solve with existing pro uh, products, services, consultant, and so on. QCRI is looking at the ones that have no solutions, where we really need to develop the technology, the research to, to address those ones, because maybe they are the most important ones in the future. And let's face reality, this is the elephant in the room. The problem is gonna be worse and worse, because you said you have to deal with old legacy system, but I encourage all the people here in the room to look at the roadmap of their uh, providers, manufacturers, uh, vendors, and so on, the big word is big data, right? Big data analytics. Everybody nowadays wants to come with a new product, a new element, something that needs to connect back. And it needs to do that to send data because they will help you, they will do the analysis, and this will lead to more efficiency. More efficiency means more money, so you want that, right? So the poor IT guy, the poor security guy will say, no, 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 I, I don't want this. And somebody else somewhere in the company will say, I want this because you know, this brings money, this brings revenues. And this is gonna be more complicated, more and more and more. And um, I think we should definitely recognize that. Again, any questions in the audience? Please, Dr. Dirham in the front row. As we may wait for the, um, 
for the microphone. Mr. Zobla, what's your view on that? Sure. So I'd just like to follow on from what Mark was mentioning. This is actually an unrealistic kind of scenario. There's definitely a symbiotic relationship between the organization and the automation contractor. You can't divorce that relationship. Um, so it's very much about um, trusting the likes of Honeywell, Yakagawa, ABB, but at the same time, equipping the individuals within the organization to have that risk-based approach and asking the right questions in order to verify what the actual current state is. Well, let's put the question another way. Is enough, we know that the, 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 the consultant support globally as well as regionally is available. Is the other half being done adequately? The building internal capacity. Mr. Alkabi said he struggles with talent, but is there a commitment to build that internal capacity. So this is actually a global problem at the moment. You've got three mix of skill sets, essentially. You've got the IT skills, uh, you've got the operational technology skills, and in the middle, you've got the security skill set. So traditionally, what's been happening is that of the last decade or so, as the archaic systems within the OT environment are becoming more updated, becoming more in terms of having networks and IP protocol, the, the likes of lead instrument engineers have to then upskill their, their knowledge of general networks. But since the advent of Stuxnet, they now have to become more savvy with security. And with the likes of national standards coming along, they now need to have OT knowledge, IT knowledge, and security knowledge. So it's, it's a massive problem that needs massive. to be addressed. Dr. Dirham, Vice President of yes. Qatar University uh, Research. My question is addressed to Mr. Hama. Uh, based on the uh, cyber attack that occurred in 2012 for Rasgaz, how would uh, this had uh, reflected on your uh, stakeholders, mainly your clients? Uh, you know, supplying uh, them uh, on time, uh, on target. Uh, have, have you faced any, you know, uh, credibility issues? And how did your partners, such as ExxonMobil or others, supported? Rasgas in addressing this challenge. My second question is how to turn this challenge into an opportunity, okay? By, for example, uh, uh, aligning with uh, QCERT, uh, Qatar ICT, maybe the Kindi, uh, Kiri, QBRI, all of these, you know, uh, linking industry with academia to address and have intensive uh, research or study so that we can have, you know, a lesson learned out of this and so that we can convert this into a better opportunity for us in the future. Well, thank you, doctor, for the question. Credibility. Yeah, I must say that uh, in Raskas, we are well trained to deal with uh, big incident. So every year we at least have two scenarios of something happening in the plant, a ship, something happening to... So, we were well trained for incident, but we were not trained at all for a cyber attack. What we did, we did handle it the same way we, we deal with this incident. And I must say, they are completely two different things. We did manage our customer, I think, well. I think we were immediately notifying our customer of what's happening, to assure them of everything that is going well, that the, their delivery will be on time, and they shouldn't be worried. We did manage the communication well with our uh, stakeholder, with the, with the media, and everybody else. It did take us some time. Really, it was a big shock for us. So it did take some time to... to uh, the, the, the challenge is, and I will come back to your research question, but the challenge I, I, I faced, actually, and I think uh, Ahmed is here, which I think worked with me as an IT manager at the time, how do you recover your system while you're investigating them to understand what's happening at the same time? So how do you keep this team motivated? They were working around the clock. And yet you want to ask them the hard question trying to find out what's happening. So that's something I think is, is, is I hope nobody goes through that, but you need to, to do that. I think there were a lot of things that we thought we are prepared for, and we have had couple of what called business continuity scenarios and people spend a lot of time and bring consultant. When it's come to really activating that on a real, real life scenarios, we faced a lot of challenges. A lot of our documents were in the system and the system was, was gone. Why? <laughs> the, the printout that we had was outdated. 
So we, we wanted to fresh out uh, that. So there were a lot of hard experiences, I must say. And there were, I must say, that the company came much stronger. I think we, we, we learned a lot and we uh, learned cross, not just with this specific incident, but all other system were also uh, validated and checked to ensure that we did have a, a, a lot of significant improvement to this system to, to bring them to really to be able to face such a challenge in the future. With regard to the, to the, to the opportunities question, and research, yes, the, I think there is a great opportunity. The, the, I think our working with our QCERT and ICT, I think was, to me, it was because I, I, I interfaced with, with them. I think their support during this time, we couldn't do without. I think if we didn't have that capability with ICT, QCERT capability on the forensic side, especially, we would struggle. I just to address the, the, the challenge with resources. Yeah. The two qualified vendors who could do deal with this uh, incident at the time, there was Rasgaz and Aramco, and they were spread thin to support both of us. And they had to subcontract to bring people from all different, and they were not really well connected to their system or their processes. So that just tell you that even even the vendor who's supposed to be specialized, if there are multiple attacks in the region, you will not find the support you expect to get, even if you are ready to pay more money. Yeah. So that's but in the research, I think there are opportunities for research. I just gave one example, the complexity. We are building very complex systems and we are building on top of it very complex process and structures. And we think we are hiring smart people that they know what's going on. You only discover how much they know when you have incidents. <laughs> it's, it, is, it is really, there is a false sense of security. And I'll tell you, most IT manager, and I was one of them, will bring you a chart with KPI telling you you're, you're okay. Everything is green. I'm monitoring everything is green. It's a green for one week because there is more political tension, and you can see it on the TV, and they're not updating their KPI. There are more people, qualified IT people on the street. There is no employment rate is going up and around you, and you can see that. And they are telling you that you're, you're agreed. Let's go to the last question and also wrap up comments from the panel. So if we might just uh, take this question and then take your final thoughts. On which of the following should Qatar prioritize to improve security for the domestic energy sector? A, data gathering and information sharing. B, develop domestic security expertise and hacking culture. C, educate workers and the general public about cybersecurity threats. And D, define responsibilities of stakeholders. I removed E, which was inevitably all of the above, uh, because I, 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 I want a, a sense of what is the most pressing priority, uh, and for everybody to sort of make a judgment on that, uh, of which is really the number one for you, rather than all of the above. But what is your number one uh, on this list? Ten seconds, please. And if we can get each of the panelists to comment on their answer to this as to what their number one was or is. Okay, so C, educate workers and the general public about cybersecurity threats, 45%, uh, which seems a bit of a, I'd be surprised by that answer. I would think maybe more of the granular tactical side would be important, but um, 33, it developed domestic security expertise and hacking culture. So, Under Secretary, how did you vote on your closing comments, please? Uh, I selected B. B. And uh, I think C and B are probably, uh, you know, it's, it's one combined answer because uh, I hear my friend Al Hamad because we worked together with him in 2012. Uh, the team that worked with Hamad, they're here. I'd like to acknowledge them also. The, the panel over here, they had a session after this one. Um, 
something mentioned earlier about the institutions we have in Doha, and Doha is blessed, and I think, yes, Doha is blessed because we have the institutions. Now, the institution or the education, academic institution has an obligation to produce B plus. You know, and uh, hopefully after this date, 28 April, you know, we will see a change in the curriculums of institutions, if it's Texas a and if it's QU, if it's Carnegie Mellon, to focus on number B, because there is a demand in the market, and you can hear from Mr. Hammer, there is a high demand in the market. I need a successor. We don't have successors in those positions. That's another issue. And the only way I can resolve this issue is by mass coming from academic institutions. Aligning industries' needs with academics' courses. Anna, your, your vote and, and, and closing thoughts? Uh, my vote was also for B. B? The domestic security expertise in hacking culture. So in terms of priority, let, let's take a look at the, um, the uh, economy of Qatar. 70% uh, of the... Um, uh, revenues coming from petroleum and LNG uh, industry. And as we already know, there have been two incidents of um, um, some cyber incidents or intrusion here in Qatar itself. So uh, not only are the threats real and here and now, we know that in the future with, with um, increased cyber campaigns targeted towards Middle East, this is now going to be the battleground. So we do, need to do, do you that. think, given that vulnerability at the moment with the legacy of challenge that you face, that there is an operational vulnerability, not just like Raskas had a, a corporate administrative one, but actual operational? Does that concern you, the vulnerability of that? Absolutely. There are some intrusion detection and monitoring tools that IT can deploy that we will never ever be able to deploy in our environment. So at this point, we are running blind. The best we can do is secure a perimeter, put it in the border, but the technology to actually do intrusion detection down at the level of the very uh, machines that drive our process today is not available. Mr. Muller, you, you, your uh, vote and... So my vote was C. C. Um, and um, I would just say that uh, I think I have a somewhat unique perspective because I've had a chance to also do a similar kind of survey across the 32 organizations at the Cybersecurity Partnership Forum. I've also had an opportunity to engage with the various ministries when it came to developing the national cybersecurity strategy. And it's, it's my opinion that pretty much the technology is pretty much there in place, but it's the age old problem that people seem to think that cybersecurity is just an IT problem. And that's pretty much the mindset here that needs to really be broken. I think the Ministry of Interior think it's more than an IT problem <laughs> with their engagement on the challenge. Dr. Mark, your vote and how you uh, closing thoughts? So uh, I looked at the whole question and yeah. it ends with for the domestic energy sector. This is why I said I voted for A. A. Without that, I would have said B or C if it was for Qatar in general. But I said A because I think we are driving a bit blind right now. We don't really know how specifically domestic energy sector has been under attack. And we need that information in order to, to come with better uh, defenses. But, and, and I'd like to follow on what has been said earlier about education. I think it's, it is very important. It has to be done so to, to create more educated people uh, in Qatar. We definitely have a big problem of, in terms of talents. You, know, you have talked about hiring talents. It is not just Qatar, it's everywhere in the world. Last week, someone told me about a project between France and Germany to create a, a research lab for cybersecurity of 200 people. I mean, and this is just one example. Luxembourg is doing the same, Singapore, the, in the US, I'm not even, I mean, it's everywhere. So it's a future, and, and let's be honest, when people in cybersecurity do not necessarily look at this region as the place to go to work, right? They don't think of it naturally. So I think we can turn that into an opportunity because here we, those people who work in cybersecurity, they like to see applied research. They like to see their work being used. 
And there is a big disjunct in the rest of the world between academia and industry. It's very hard for them to see their stuff being used. They try in different way, open source and so on and so forth. I think here in Qatar, we have educated partners in industry. We have an ecosystem with QSTP, with QNRF, with different kinds of, and QSRI, Q, of course, where we could make this place, if we were you know, aligning this thing, this thing properly, we could make this place the great place for those people to come for these it could projects become to be a applied. center of excellence. Yes, definitely. given the, the opportunity, there is there is definitely a big opportunity to bring here the people who who like to do this kind of work and improve the overall security of. Qatar. Well, I think it's an appropriate place to sort of conclude in the context of celebrating or seeking new talent and young talent, and where we started the morning with celebrating the four uh, award winners and recognizing their contribution to the expansion of postgraduate education and 